CommitToWealth.com, creating a legacy by committing to real estate wealth. Welcome back to the Commit to Wealth podcast. This is your host, Juan Vargas, bringing you yet another awesome guest. With us today is Alex Olson. A little bit about Alex. Alex is a multifamily investor and commercial real estate sales agent based out of Kansas City. Using creative strategies, Alex has gone from zero to 11 multifamily or single family units in only 18 months without using any of his own money. He's now here to share with us how you can also find similar investment opportunities and use creative financing techniques to minimize your cash in your deals. Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, Juan. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. So, um, yeah, before we jumped on, on, or before we hit the record button, you're kind of telling us a little bit about your background, um, and you know, how you were able to, to acquire your deals, man. And it's a pretty, pretty good stuff. So, um, you know, before we get there though, I want you to see if you can share your background, you know, tell us who is Alex Olson. Yeah, I am a, um, now, I guess now a real estate investor and a commercial real estate agent here in Kansas city. But my background was I grew up in a farming community in eastern part of Nebraska. Uh, we, you know, wasn't really a, didn't come from any wealth or anything. I mean, my parents did well for themselves, but, you know, like I was saying earlier, it's not like we came from 401ks and, and large trust funds and any, any kind of thing like that. So um, that's really kind of how I grew up. But I always had a, a, a desire to do something bigger, move to a bigger town uh, and do what I call bigger things in business. So I always was, was after the, the, you know, working on my own. My dad always worked on his own. He was a farmer. He worked really hard at it. I wanted to work on my own as well. Not necessarily on farming, but uh, you know, be my own boss. Gotcha. So here we are today and you have done some, some amazing things. You know, can you talk us a little bit about how real estate even came into the picture, right? You, you, you mentioned your background in farming. Um, you were in a small town. Um, you now live in Kansas city. You know, how did all that take place? Yeah. So, um, I've been, I was pr prior to my real estate life. I was in gra I was a graphic designer and I was in financial technology for 14, almost 15 years. And my wife and I actually decided that we were going to build our own house. Uh, we bought a nice lake lot, actually had a little cabin on it. We lived there for a couple of years. Every dollar that I made, that we made together as a family, I saved and decided that, you know, someday soon we were going to build our dream house. So we built our dream house um, and I managed most of the project myself did a lot of the design on it. I'm not an architect by any means, but just kind of had the general, here's how we want the lake a uh, lot to, to position. Here's what the views we want, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, at the end of the day, once we'd completed that, um, and, and during the whole process, I was like, man, I really love real estate. I, I always thought maybe I kind of did, you know, just because of looking at buildings, wanted to be an architect when I was a kid, all that kind of simple stuff. Uh, but doing the, the building process is like, man, I love real estate. I don't think I really necessarily want to go into, you know, single family home flipping or any of those kind of things, but I, I love this process. And after we had completed the house, it turns out that the cost to complete it was uh, several hundred thousand dollars less than what it appraised for. And so, you know, growing up in the farming community and the way we kind of did, we didn't have tons of money laying around. And I knew that my network, of uh, that I had kind of built over time was all based around graphic designers and financial technology. So there wasn't a lot of private money people out there or real estate mentors. And so I knew my only option was to use other people's money. Uh, and the, the best and cheapest option to start was uh, using a home equity line of credit. And so we tapped into that uh, tell, tell us real quick what that is, right? A home equity yeah. line of credit. You know, for those of the audience members that don't know, haven't heard of it, um, maybe it's an option for them, you know, to be a creative as well. You know, tell us what that is exactly. So in a home equity line of credit, what you have is, you, let's say, for example, I always like to use examples and I use simple math because I'm a simple mind. So let's say, for example, you own your own home and you have maybe maybe you spent uh, $100,000 on that house. Over time, you've paid that down to now maybe you only owe $80,000. And so you have $20,000 of equity in your home 
that you can't really tap into. It's a great thing that you've been paying down debt, um, but there's, there's money there that you could use to use that $20,000. You, you get what's called a home equity line of credit or HELOC from a, I would recommend a local lender and you extract that $20,000 in this example out and you can then use that as a down payment on an investment property. And that's not using any of your own money. It's not using your savings. You're going to pay a pretty low interest rate on that. Maybe similar to what you're getting, maybe a point, uh, 1% higher, uh, than what your actual home mortgage might be, mm -hmm. but you could start to build your rental, uh, real estate investing property empire, or if you're into flipping, whatever the case may be, you can use that to, to your advantage. And, and one thing to note real quick is it's, it's kind of used as you got, you have to view it as a credit card, right? A credit card is not going to charge you interest as long as you're not owing anything, right? So if, if you have a zero balance, then you're paying 0% interest, right? Because there, there's no balance on there. But you know, the moment that you use this, this HELOC, this home equity line of credit, that's when the interest kicks in. So just something that for, for people to, to be aware of, but it, it opens up so many opportunities uh, you know, that you maybe otherwise didn't have, right? If you didn't have the cash in hand or if you didn't have the network, like you're mentioning, um, Alex, you know, but you're, you're being creative because what you do have is, is some equity in your home and that you can use, right? So, so very good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's a, the whole, you make a great point. It sits there in your account and you don't, if you don't have to use it, if you don't want to, mm -hmm. um, it's just sitting there. And so that's kind of what we did. We extracted this home equity line of credit, sat in a bank account, uh, didn't cost me anything until I was ready to move on to acquiring properties. Um, and so I had this home equity line of credit rewinding a little bit. I also, during the whole building of the house process, I knew this is what I was wanting, wanting to get into. But again, I didn't have a network of, of resources to go out and be able to finance things. And so um, I started reading Brandon Turner's book on, you know, no or low money down real estate investing options. And it's a, a great, very basic book. It covers a whole bunch of different options on real estate investing and how to, how to source deals. And so that's really where I had confidence in going to the bank and, and getting this line of credit, uh, knowing that that's what tons and tons of other investors had done that allowed my wife and I to feel confident that, you know, this wasn't going to get us into a huge hole. You know, I would never recommend a home equity line of credit to go put a pool in your backyard or, or <laughs> you know, um, to, to buy a brand I, new car or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah. I always recommend that you've got to use it only for investment purposes into something that is. That's going to create uh, more opportunity, yeah. more wealth, more, more cash flow. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's what I did. Okay. So tell us about that first deal, right? So, so you had this home equity line of credit now secured, you know, you're, you're ready to use it with any opportunity that you come across. What was that first opportunity? Yeah. So I'm out, I'm out here. Um, house is completed. I know I want to do multifamily only at least at this point in time. And so I also wanted to be very, very recession resistant in terms of the location you know, it wasn't necessarily about what the house or the duplex or the fourplex looked like, but it was a location. And so I said in Kansas City, it's uh, not that super walkable. So I really wanted to have a rule set of, you know, two blocks within something major. And by major, I mean either a major university or a hospital that is, I mean, hospitals right now we know are, are growing fast and expanding or some type of economic driver, like a streetcar line, or even a large bus stop, or something that was going to spur economic development. Mm -hmm. So that was my rule. I need to be two blocks within that, so that way anybody could walk to it. If it's, you know, some, you know, college students or employees of whatever institution that is. And so I went on to Zillow, which was my favorite app at the time, and you know, drew a whole bunch of different maps on Zillow. Okay. I want to be two blocks within this two blocks. And so that way I wasn't getting flooded with uh, constant email notifications on my phone of every little house that was coming to the market or every duplex or whatever. And so one had popped up on there and, you know, a lot of people say, well, you don't want to buy off the MLS. You know, everybody's looked at them, all the good deals go fast, all that kind of stuff, which may or may not be true in, in many locations. But if you're watching the market very closely, like I was, 
you can identify properties that are sitting for a long period of time. And if it comes in your hot zone, you don't necessarily need to, to jump on it. You can let it sit for a while, especially if it's something that's maybe a little bit funky about it, which is what this duplex was that I ended up buying uh, that I'm going to talk about here in a second that's two blocks away from KU Med. But so that's what happened. So there was a duplex that popped up on there. It's, mm -hmm. It was, you know, well overpriced. It looked like it was maybe going to fall down. It said it was a duplex, <laughs> but the, the photos looked like maybe it was a family home. You know, it, it wasn't marketed the greatest thing in the world. It also came on and said that it's only a two bedroom, one bath at both units of the duplex. And so, um, but I, I had driven by it because I actually worked kind of close by. And so, okay, yep, I can see it's a duplex because there's a, a back entrance. It's a separate entrance, which is, which is great. You don't have to share an entrance with anybody. Um, and then it also mentioned in the listing that it had a large office. Both units had large offices. And so I did some research and was like, huh, you don't actually need a closet to be considered a bedroom. So it turns out each one of these units of the duplex were actually a three bedroom, one bath which, you know, you can get a couple hundred bucks more, at least a hundred dollars more in rent. Um, you know, so I was, so then I was I kept crunching the numbers on it and the price started to drop. And so then I started communicating directly with the agent. I wasn't having, I didn't have an agent representing me. I just uh, felt it was best to go direct to the, to the real estate, the listing the, agent. The listing agent. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what I did. We finally agreed on a price. And um, turns out, yep, I walked the inside and there was the three bedrooms, one bath. It wasn't really a, a closet situation or a uh, office situation. And so I bought it at a, a discount, even though it was on the MLS, sat there for a while. And I saw an opportunity that others probably overlooked because they, you know, it, it didn't sell fast and it also was maybe smaller than what they thought. So that's another word of advice is to always, you know, if you see something you think is pretty good, you just keep, keep peeling away the onion to, to find out what's really behind it. Got it. Got it. So what was the, the price that you were able to, to secure this deal for? Um, you know, tell us, you know, maybe uh, a high level view of what kind of renovations you had to put into it and then, you know, how it is now, how it's performing now. Yeah. Yeah. So I also knew I wanted to buy what I always call near term key. I don't want hardly a whole lot of projects to it, especially on my first investment. I was, you know, busy working a, a W-2 job, uh, young, very young family. You know, at the time I had probably a two and a four year old. Um, so anyway, I, I first started off listing that it might've been either 220 or 215 was the listing price. And then it dropped the price. I think it dropped it to 195 after 60 days. I ended up buying it for 175. Um, nice. Yeah, so it came down. And then as far as the work I need to put into it, so the, the building was completely vacant, which is kind of hard to finance actually sometimes um, because the tenants had just moved out. So I had the opportunity there. It's pros and cons. Uh, the opportunity was I could put my own tenants in there, uh, which I'd never done before, by the way, but sounded fun. Um, and... Uh, I could also turn, uh, you know, advertise and market it as a three bedroom, one bath. And so I, and I painted the door red to make it look less like it was falling in, you know, like a nice bright red color mm -hmm. that was, you know, HGTV style front of the magazine, added some red Adirondack plastic chairs out front um, and took some better pictures of the inside, cleaned everything up, got rid of a whole bunch of, um, it wasn't trash. It was just, you know, college kids junk that had accumulated in the back porch, added a washer and dryer into the back porch, uh, that I actually didn't pay for myself because I, I rent appliances from an appliance company. So I never have to worry about servicing them or, or anything. Um, and then I also, um, I added some HVAC work to it, to, to make sure that all the rooms had good, you know, flowing air conditioning, um, serviced the HVAC and secured some issues that the basement foundation had, but I think I maybe put $4,500 into it, maybe 5,000. Um, you know, yeah, and, that's, and maybe, that's nothing in the grand scheme of things. You know, you buy it for, you know, you said one, 175, 
Um, you put in, you know, 45, maybe 5,000, you know, on the high end. I mean, that's, that's at the, you know, if you're looking at it from the, the high level view, that's, that's really nothing. Um, and, and really most of it, you know, well, I, I would imagine that the 175, you got it from the HELOC, right? Is that correct? Mm-hmm. You paid for it with the HELOC, then you paid maybe out of pocket, maybe you were out, you know, four or five grand. Um, but that's pretty much it for the most part, right? Or, or, yeah. or is there something else that's missing? No, exactly. So yeah, I use the home equity line of credit to, to finance the equity side of the transaction. So mm-hmm. I actually use a Fannie Freddie loan, so secondary market loan to get that financed. So it required 25% down, but it gave me, you know, 30 year fixed rate at the time, which was a great rate at the time, which was five and a half um, percent. Now we all know rates are a lot lower, Twos. but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so no, it's okay. Uh, that's awesome though. That's awesome that, you know, you're pretty much, you know, out of pocket, very, very little, very minimal firm, you know, compared to what the value and in, in, in appraisal, I would imagine on, on the property, you know, what is worth today. Right. Yep. Um, so that's, a, that was a good, very, a very good first investment. You know, tell us about your, your, maybe your latest one, you know, what have you done with that one? Um, you know, tell us the details on that one as well. Um, you know, because I mean, you're, you're getting, you're getting creative here. Um, with your HELOC, but are there other ways that you, where you have been creative as well? Yeah. So, um, all of my, well, all, yeah, all my deals have been through creative financing. Every single one I've got, I did, uh, I purchased six different buildings, we'll call them. And my most recent deal I did was on single family homes. And the reason why I went to a single family home route was because again, I have my very strict requirements of within a couple blocks. And so as the market in Kansas city continues to heat up, it's been heating, you know, heating up for 15 years or so, but here, this is two years ago almost. And now I'm like, man, I still really want to expand my, my empire, so to speak, even though it's a tiny empire. And, uh, but I don't want to stray away from my rules. And so, there was a house actually that was originally a house and then was converted into an office. It's two blocks. Actually, it's a block away from Children's Mercy Hospital, which was also going through a $150 million uh, renovation and, and expansion. And in that, this house had been converted to a law office. So it was a cool old 1905, uh, built 1905 house, but it needed some work. And so I was looking at it, looking at it. It took me a year to convince the, the seller. It was a for sale by owner. Um, she had listed on LoopNet, CoStar, MLS over the time, and she wanted way too much money for it. But I knew I wanted it. I didn't have the money to finance it. My HELOC was gone because of the other investments I had done. And so I came to her and said, hey, look, I'll give you your overpriced price that you want for this property. But... I need you to um, sell it to me on a lease purchase option. So in a lease purchase option, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of seller financing options. I guess a lease purchase option is a version of seller financing, but in the very true sense of a lease purchase option, me as the buyer, I'm not taking title to it, title of the property until I execute the option to buy it. And we go into a normal, uh, contract to close at that point. So in a lease purchase option, you have two documents. You have a standard lease, which is almost identical to what you're using when you are renting an apartment from somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it says, Hey, you can't do this. You can't do that. You're responsible for this and that. Mm -hmm. And then you have, that's one set of documents. And then you have the actual option document that that discusses um, the purchase price or the purchase price is set. It's talked about how much money you've put down on the property. If any, it talks about the time frame that you have to exercise this option. Um, and so that, once you execute that contract, that puts you into a normal closing uh, contract. And so that's what I did with this property. And I didn't have any money to, to get that deal done. Um, I'd actually had, you talked, we talked about that duplex I bought and talked about it being worth more than what I paid for it. So a year after I bought it, I went ahead and uh, took out a line of credit on that property because it was worth $215,000 because again, it was a three bedroom, one bathroom, not a two bedroom, one bathroom. So 
Um, I, I had already used all that. I tapped out all my other money. So I went ahead and uh, got a personal loan, standard personal loan from a, a SoFi kind of provider or a Prosper or Lending Club, whatever uh, of these kind of alternative but large providers are out there. Um, you know, which I wouldn't recommend for most people to, to go after and, and do. But again, like we were talking earlier, it's another uh, tool in your tool belt to, to go after properties. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's not something that because these are personally <laughs> guaranteed, right? Even the HELOC, right? It's your it's it's a it's a personal guarantee. But you know, again, if if you don't have many options, right, and and you know that there's an opportunity in front of you, you 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 have very little options as far as maybe cash available, uh, because your equity and your cash is all tied up, right? Then then what do you do, right? And, and I've had. Um, you know, you know, guests that have used their credit cards, right? You know, they have, you know, you know, twenty thousand dollars on the credit card, thirty thousand, you name it, and and they use it, right? Because yes, there's risk with that, but the upside is is so much greater, right? And 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 they have a, an exit strategy, right? So that that's all part of it, right? To before you go into the deal, um, and they're able to to make it happen, they're successful with it, and. Yeah, it just becomes part of their story, right? And and I would imagine something similar with you, right? With you using using this personal loan. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, you got to shop around. I'm not talking about a, a payday loan that's got two, three, four, five hundred percent interest rate mm -hmm. on it. I'm talking about a uh, a personal loan. If you shop around, do your research. I mean, you can get a personal loan like I did with uh, for an interest rate of maybe ten percent over paid back over seven years. You know, you look at a hard money loan. I mean, that's 10, 11, 12 percent oftentimes, but that's due, you know, right within, away. Yeah, right away, within a few months or you know, maybe a couple of years at, at, you know, at uh, the longest. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you're able to, to um, set up a, a personal uh, loan and, and what'd you do from there? So I had the personal loan and I used that. And what money. was the amount for? What was that amount for? Uh, I was actually able to get a hundred thousand dollar personal loan. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, which was <laughs> quite, uh, <laughs> quite large and, and maybe lucky. I don't know what it was, but I called, I used SoFi and I called them a lot and I had a good W2 income, uh, which was good and you know, great credit. So I think, you know, a lot of those things are, are help you get the maximum you can get. What, what was your interest rate again? I think it's somewhere around, uh, it's under 11%. It's like 10.09 or 10.2, something like that. Got it. Okay. So you, so you had a $100,000 loan, at, you know, give or take, you know, 10%. Okay. Yep. And so I use that to give the owner of this property some down payment because she wanted, you know, if you're buying a $400,000 house uh, and you got to put 20% down in a bank, that's, uh, what is it, $80,000? Um, that's a lot of money. And so I didn't want to do that. So that's why I went the lease purchase option route. And so I gave her $20,000 and said, you know, we'll, we'll take this to contract to a, a regular contract at a later date. And then I had to put some money into it because uh, it was a law office. And so I needed to rehab it to get it to an Airbnb house, which was what my goal was. Due to the location, it was, due to, it was close to the hospital it was also within two blocks of Crown Center, which is the headquarters of, of uh, Hallmark Cards. Uh, they also have an entertainment and family district there as well. Um, and so I knew it would do well as an Airbnb. And then worst case scenario, it would do well renting to hospital workers or Crown Center workers, anybody if I needed to on a long-term basis. And so, so the, the important piece here real quick is that you had a couple of different exit strategies, right? I mean, you had a couple of different ways. If, if a plan A doesn't work, then we can go to plan B, right? And, and I think that's one of the most important things. Um, and it's actually a must, right? It's not just one of the most important things. It's, it's a must where you have to have a couple of different ways out. Um, and, and I wouldn't say out of the deal. That's not what I'm referring to. But um, you have to have a couple of different ways. If plan A doesn't work, plan B is, is here. And in your case, it was your first option was Airbnb, right? And, yep. and, and obviously we're in COVID-19 and, and you may want to discuss that a little bit too, but COVID-19, you know, not many people are traveling, not many people are, are, are staying in Airbnb. Um, it's, it's kind of on pause for now, right? Mm -hmm. But the good thing is that 
you also looked at plan B from, from the very beginning and use that as another option as well. Yeah. So this was a year ago when, you know, economies at the, I bought this uh, or mm-hmm. did this lease purchase option a year ago and the economy is at the height of everything. And so, yeah, I was planning on huge Airbnb. There wasn't a, a lot of competition in my area for a five bedroom house. This was a five bedroom house. Um, and so I knew it was going to do well, but um, I also had it in the back of my mind that worst case, you know, something happens, Airbnb gets shut down due to, you know, legal reasons, whatever, whatever the case may be, or maybe the neighborhood association shuts down Airbnb. I could still rent it out at a pretty dang decent rate. Uh, one, because I did nice finishes in it when I was kind of upgrading the, the property. And two, because of the location, you couldn't beat the location for anybody that worked at the hospital or even downtown, it was only a few, you know, few minute drive. Um, so that was on all my properties. Again, why I chose this, you know, two block radius thing was there's always an A, B, C, D on it. And, and the D part is the forced appreciation. So I may have bought it or had it in a contract for three thirty, three hundred thirty thousand um, dollars but the forced appreciation, over a short period of time because of everything going on in, in Kansas City in that market was going to get me equi- forced equity. So I've got even more equity that I can use to refinance or if I wanted to sell it and 1031 exchange into something else, I had all these different options I could play with mm-hmm. uh, after I had executed the, the contract on it. Awesome. Yeah, and I really like that because it's, you know, you were resourceful, right? And so, you know, maybe you didn't have the cash again, you know, at that time, um, it was tied up, but you came up with a, with a, with a plan and that was, you know, do the lease option, you know, you're, you're leasing the property, uh, from that owner. And, and, and during that period, by the way, did you lease it yourself? I mean, or did you have somebody else, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you had somebody else and you kind of sub leased it. Is that, is that the, the process that you did? Yeah. So on my Airbnb properties, I have a property manager come in there and actually do the day-to-day on them and make sure that they maximize the prices on them. Um, you know, cause that's a, a lot of work for, I mean, you can get great returns. Don't get me wrong, but especially if you have a W2 job and you've got two, three, four Airbnb properties plus it, apartments, um, I couldn't do it. You know, there's no, no time available for me to get that done. Um, and so, but when COVID hit, you know, as of right now, I turned a couple of them into long-term rentals. This particular one I'm turning into a long-term rental right now, at least to get me through, you know, uh, another 12 months. Hopefully the economy comes back. I can still use that furniture that's in there and people start traveling more. Um, but, but that's a, you know, an, another piece to the puzzle is having a good team available to you to be able to get some of these things in place and, and, uh, manage your <laughs> assets for you. Yeah. That's, that's automatic. That's, that's obviously p- part of the, the, the puzzle, uh, part of the formula, right? You got to have a, a strong team. Otherwise you're not, you're not going to be successful. Okay. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, some things that you have learned, you know, maybe one or two things that you have learned throughout your deals. Right. And, and you know, again, this is, you know, using that, that creative hat, right. That creative mindset, you know, give us a couple of things that, that you have learned, uh, throughout your deals. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing I've learned, and the good thing is I've always kind of had this available to me because of my personality, but it's persistence. You've got to be persistent in real estate. Don't give up. You know, I never gave up on a deal until it was gone. So there was a lot of deals that I missed out on, you know, just like all of us that, you know, maybe you tried uh, to get them down an extra $2,000. Um, that's, that's something I've learned as well. But uh, per- persistence is key in securing real estate. Don't give up on it until it's gone. Good, good. I, I like that one. And that one's, it- it's very important because, you know, we tend as, as human beings, most of the time we tend to, to, you know, give up, you know, rather quickly. If, if somebody, you know, tells us no, it, it shouldn't mean no, but for, to a lot of us, it, it does raise, right? you know, there, there are no, there's a no right there in front of us. And it's already shut down. And so we kind of move away from it and we go to something else. Right. Mm-hmm. But you know, you use that keyword and that's persistence, you know, go back to it. You know, some of these deals you're waiting for, for a year, right. You know, you saw the price, you know, go down on, I think it was that duplex. You saw the price go down and go down. There's your, your first deal. Um, and then you were able to get it at a much lower price, you know, valued for, you know, you know, what, 40, 50 grand more than, than mm-hmm. what you purchased it for. Right. So, 
you know, persistence is key, you know, in, in everything that you do, you know, and, and especially when you're, you're coming um, and you're looking at deals and you want to acquire some deals, you know, be persistent and, and knock on a door, you know, and, you know, understand, you know, what the, the other person needs, you know, and that was the other key for, for you on, the, on that lease option, right? You, you listened and you understand what, what they needed um, and you, you made a deal work, right? So I really like that. Um, so it's time for our nuggets of wealth. Uh, these are questions that, that we ask every guest every week and hopefully they are also able to help them out. So question number one is what is a good tool, source, or platform that you use almost daily that can also help others? My favorite tool right now is LinkedIn. Um, and I, I don't say that generically just because it's a huge social networking platform and everybody and their mom's on it. <laughs> but I use, <laughs> I use that because uh, it's, it's a tool you can reach out to, not only when you're researching properties and property owners and locations, you can use that to, to find, for example, right now in my, in my day job as a real estate agent, you know, I'm calling on property owners and asking if, you know, they're, what their real estate plans are. I can look them up on LinkedIn, kind of find out what they're doing. I can use it as a research, uh, as, as a, find out what their background is, where, you know, where they live right now, all that kind of stuff that you can even use even when you're looking for investment deals. You know, let's say I'm not a real estate agent, but I'm, I'm still looking to buy deals. I use the same tool, right? Who owns this property? Oh, it's Jim Smith. Well, let me go see if I can find anything on Jim Smith based on this address. Oh yeah, here he is on LinkedIn. It says he's a real estate investor. You know, it says that he works at, um, you know, Amazon or whatever. And so you can use that in your conversations with people to develop that relationship, to, to gain trust with them, um, which I think is very important. You know, we don't want to do deals with people that are untrustworthy and, and deal with people that, you know, just aren't authentic. Yeah. And, and that's part of the key in, in making a deal become successful or even, even acquiring a deal, right? Um, um, going under contract, right, is, is knowing who the other person is, right? Understanding who, who the, the seller is, understanding who the buyer is. Uh, you got to know each other, right? And, and as, as much as information as you can know about that person, it'll help with the, the conversation. It'll help build rapport, um, you know, and it just makes things easier. So I think that's, that's awesome. You know, I'll, I use LinkedIn, um, you know, heavily as well. Maybe not as much as you do, but, but uh, I'm on there a lot because there's a lot of uh, very, there's a lot of people that are very insightful, you know, and, yeah. and they can bring in a lot, a lot of knowledge. Uh, hopefully you can also add value to them, but it's, it's a very good, um, good network on there. So I like that. Which book are you currently reading and which one has had the biggest impact on your life? Right now I'm reading uh, the E-Myth. I don't know if it's E-Myth Revisited, mm -hmm. but it's one of the E-Myth books, but it's specific to real estate. So it's, it's got Than Merrill uh, narrated. I, this is an audible. So Than Merrill narrates it along with Michael Gerber. Um, it's, it's all about real estate, your systems, and, and how to develop uh, uh, your mindset around developing a team. It's pretty good. It's fine. But then to answer your other question about what was your second question? Which one has had the biggest impact on your life? Biggest impact on my life is, am I being too subtle by Sam Zell? And I love that book. It's an autobiography about how he was, he came from, you know, maybe going to law school, getting his law degree to being a real estate, a billion dollar real estate investor and how he, found ways to get deals done. He didn't walk into a deal finding out like, how can I not do this deal? He came in there and said, I like this property. How can I get a deal done on this property? And that's one of the things I take to every deal that I'm working on. Awesome. Yeah. That's a book that I've been wanting to read. I, I did listen to the interview on uh, Tim Ferriss's uh, podcast. Um, I don't know if you listened to that one, but they interviewed him and, and, you know, he also talked about his story. Um, and you know, the guy's awesome. You know, that's all I can say. The guy's awesome. Um, you know, just his, his background, um, you know, just his drive, you know, um, he's, he's a beast, right? So that's, yeah. that's what I can say about him. He's, he's awesome. Uh, do you have any rules for success that you live by? I've talked about it and it's just very simple, just the persistence of it, persistence mm -hmm. in life. You don't have to be a, an a-hole, uh, you know, persistence. And, and the thing that really hit a home run for me was when I was, I was reading uh, a Grant Cordone book on 
uh, how to sell. I, I don't know exactly the title because he's got, you know, a hundred books or whatever. But. Sell, sell or be sold. Maybe one, one like uh, that. Right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah. And he talks about how, you know, children are told no a million times, but they keep asking for it anyway and how successful they are in getting what they want. And so, you know, everybody loves children for the most part. Right. And so <laughs> that was kind of an interesting thing to me where, you've got this annoying kid uh, asking for something and finally the parents give in or the grandparent, whatever gives in. And it's so true, even in real estate. Now you don't have to beg for it, but um, I think you get the point of just being persistent, following up. That, and, and that's very true. You know, my, my five-year-old, um, whenever he, he wants something, he will keep asking. And it's like, no, nobody already told you no. And, and then he's like, but daddy, you know, yeah, I want to do this, and and he will keep asking. And so, whenever you're you're mentioning that, I thought of him, and I was like, you know what, he, he's 100 percent right, and Grant Cardone is 100 percent right as well. You know, um, you know, kids are persistent, and you know, they don't like no for an answer, right? And, and that's how we as professionals, right? And again, you said you don't have to beg for it, and you don't, you don't, but be professional about it. Don't give up. Um, you know, keep knocking on the door, and and keep trying to find you know ways that you can make something happen, right? To so you can finally get your yes, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a, that's an awesome, awesome, uh, you know, re response to that. Okay. Um, last but not least, at the end of your life, how do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered as somebody who is hardworking, honest, direct, and trustworthy. Those are my, I don't know, I don't know how many I said, but those are my three or four things that, that I want to be remembered for. Very simple honest, hardworking, trustworthy person uh, that did everything he can for his family. Good. Love it. We're going to commit to Wealth Nation, go to contact you and find out more about, you know, what you're doing. Also the real estate brokerage, uh, Clemens Real Estate. Yeah. So best way to get a hold of me is on LinkedIn. Just search for my name, uh, Alex Olson. And then you can email me at alex at clemensrealestate.com. And I'd love to hear from you and we can chat all day about creative financing or Kansas city or whatever you want to chat about. Yes. And so for everybody listening, we talked about his deals. Um, you know, as, as we just mentioned, you know, he's also licensed. So if you're looking for your own deals, it, you know, reach out to him. He can also help you. And you know, you know what the other thing is, you know, reach out to him, um, build a relationship with him. He can also help you be creative, which is, you know, what, one of the most important pieces here, be creative in your own deals, just like he was created with his deals and give you some tips and advice. I'm sure he, he'd be happy to. So uh, reach out to him, Alex at ClemensRealEstate.com. Uh, reach out to him on LinkedIn. Um, and um, yeah, that's what it's about, right? You know, connecting and reaching out. So, so Alex, you know, once again, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I think it was a, a very, very good episode. Um, it's just a lot of a lot of key, key pieces that I was able to take away personally. And I'm sure that my audience was also able to, to learn some things and, you know, just, just to make sure that, you know, we, we think a little outside the box, right? Because we're, we usually just think, think inside the box, um, you know, but there's so many different ways in real estate, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in residential or if you're in commercial, there's so many different ways that you can be creative um, and that you can make deals happen, right? Don't take no for an answer. That's the biggest thing. Make sure that you're persistent, just like Alex was, was saying. So thank you so much. And I, and I hope that you uh, continue to be successful. I appreciate it, man. Happy talking to you. And I look forward to talking again soon. Commit to wealth.com, creating a legacy by committing to real estate wealth.